Well, welcome to this final lecture in thermodynamics. This is In this lecture, we're going to just have a little bit of a course wrap-up. We're not going to cover any new material, of course. We won't cover anything really technical. I just want to review the things that we've talked about in the course and show how the course fits into the rest, rest of the curriculum. So go ahead and take a look at your screen. On the screen here, you'll see pictures of various applications. I actually showed this picture in our first video lecture, the introductory video lecture, and told you that these are some of the applications that make use of the concepts we learn in the course. So just a reminder, you know, here we have a jet engine, internal combustion engine. Here's a, a large-scale power plant. This looks like a heat exchanger. I'm not quite sure what the facility is. Air conditioning unit, a pump, a rocket nozzle, HVAC, ductwork. There's a solar power plant, a refrigerator. That looks like a turbine, again, from perhaps a power plant operation. But all of these different devices make use of thermodynamics in their analysis. And we've talked a bit about these in, in, in a very high level kind of general idea of, of within the course. So I just want to remind you that thermodynamics has a lot of applications. The techniques that you've learned in this course are used when you start doing more detailed analysis of all of these things that we've talked about. And even what we've learned in the course so far is used at um, to, to give what's called a macroscopic perspective in some of the analyses. You know, if you know what's going into like a turbine, if you know the properties of the fluid going in, you know the properties coming out, then you can say with pretty good certainty what kind of power out output you're going to get, for example. So, you know, some of the things that you've learned in this course here are directly applicable just by themselves, but they also go into more deeper analyses of these various applications. So one of the things I like to do at the end of my, the courses I teach is just go back to the learning objectives. Now these were on your course policies document. A lot of people don't really play, pay close attention to them, but they're really the things that we try to do. You know, when we put together a course, we very early on decide what the learning objectives are. What is it we want to accomplish with that course? And for this particular one, there were four learning objectives. Number one, to successfully employ systematic engineering a systematic engineering approach to problem solving. So we've talked about that, for example, setting up basic equations, you know, drawing control volumes or system boundaries, applying basic equations, doing an energy flow diagram, making appropriate assumptions, and then working through your analyses and communicating it well. Don't want to underestimate the communication part. That's very important. So we've done that, I think. I think we've accomplished that goal. Secondly, to master applying the law of conservation of mass when analyzing thermodynamics problems. We've done that as well. Ther conservation of mass has been used throughout our analyses. It's been used in a very sort of trivial way, but that's okay. Uh, you know, if we have a steady state, the mass flow rate coming in and the mass flow rate going out have to be equal to one another. Um, we did look at some transient problems as well, where the mass uh, within the control volume changes with time. Um, you'll do a lot more with conservation of mass when you get into another course like fluid mechanics, for example. Third item, to be proficient in the use of the first law of thermodynamics to perform energy accounting when solving thermodynamics problems. That's a huge part of this course. I think you'll agree on that. We've applied the first law in a variety of situations. We've looked at transient problems like pistons and cylinders, filling of a tank, emptying of a tank, as well as steady state problems like flow through a turbine, flow through a compressor, uh, and analyzing large-scale cycles. So we've done a lot of that. And then the last item here, number four, to be a competent user of the second law of thermodynamics to perform entropy balance solving thermodynamics problems. This is making use of the entropy equation that we've talked about. And just, you know, how do we use the entropy equation to show that a process is possible? How do we use it to calculate entropy generation so we can compare which processes are more advantageous thermodynamically speaking? you know, produce less entropy. And we've also used it to define efficiencies, like the, the isentropic efficiencies for a turbine, a compressor, or a nozzle, for example. So I think we've accomplished all of our learning objectives, right? That's what we set out to do. And if, if you've, you know, followed along in the course and have done the homeworks and done reasonably well on the exams and such, then I think that, that you've done all of these things. Now, the other thing I like to do is just show how all of the various topics fit together. Now, I've shown this flowchart in other lectures. 
uh, actually in, in live lectures as well, probably more often. But I think it's worth showing here as well. So what we started with were definitions, just basic definitions, so that we're all speaking the same language. What is a control volume? What's a system? What do we mean by an isobaric process? You know, those, those kinds of things that are just basic definitions, so we're all speaking the same language. And then we focused on properties. So we talked about thermodynamic, different kinds of thermodynamic properties, like specific volume, pressure, temperature, internal energy, specific enthalpy, specific entropy. We've talked about all those various properties that get used a lot in thermodynamic analyses. We talked about the use of property tables and how you look up properties when you're dealing with compressed liquids, saturated liquid vapor mixtures, superheated vapors, uh, how we make approximations for compressed liquids, how you deal with quality when you're dealing with saturated liquid vapor mixtures. And then we also talked about the use of models, so we don't have to refer to the tables. Models like the incompressible substance model and the ideal gas model. Those are used very frequently in everyday engineering analyses, so they're useful models to talk about. So, so we talked quite a bit about properties. Also, how to show where you are on a fi phase diagram. Um, you know, where's the vapor dome? And where are we relative to that? How, what does the path look like if it's isobaric or isothermal or isentropic? You know, those kinds of things. Th those are very helpful diagrams to just double check your work and just visually see what's going on in a, a process or a cycle. So then we moved on to the fundamental laws. So we talked about conservation of mass, the first law and the second law. That's really the heart of the course is, is how we apply those fundamental laws. And so the properties feed directly into those fundamental laws. Right? We use those properties to evaluate terms in the fundamental laws. And in addition, we have these things over here, actually work and heat transfer that feed into these as well. Work, and we've talked about different kinds of work, and heat transfer feed directly into the first law of thermodynamics, and heat transfer also feeds into the second law. So these are supporting relations, just like properties are. And then I show an arrow coming out here for limits of performance, so definitions of thermal efficiency, coefficients of performance, isentropic efficiencies. Those come from like the second law of thermodynamics, so you can see the arrows pointing out here. So we use that fundamental law to help us define these uh, measures of, of performance. And then lastly, well, it's not actually lastly, but the next thing is we use those fundamental laws and the supporting properties and calculations here to do problem solving. The course is largely focused on problem solving. How do we use these fundamental relations and supporting relations to solve problems? So we looked at different kinds of problems, you know, uh, closed systems, open systems, transient, uh, steady state kinds of things. We looked at cycles, you know, a whole variety of problems. So most everything's really been focused on applying these things to solving problems. And then the last item I have listed here is thermodynamic cycles of practical significance. So this is at the very end of the course. Again, we apply all the various tools that we've learned to look at cycles like a Rankine cycle, auto and diesel cycles, uh, Brayton cycle. These are common thermodynamic cycles used in application, like large power plants, vehicles, jet engines, things like that. So that's the very last topic that we covered in the course. So I, I think it's just helpful to see how all these things fit together, how it's all really focused around fundamental laws and then how we use them to solve problems. Okay. So the next thing I wanted to do is just show how thermodynamics, ME200 here at Purdue University, fits into other courses in our curriculum, specifically the undergraduate. Uh, courses. Now I have here on this, the screen, this is our undergraduate program map as of 2021 in mechanical engineering at Purdue. You know, obviously different universities have different program maps. But our course, ME200, is right, let me highlight it, it's right here in our program map. It's typically taken by mechanical engineering majors in their sophomore year other majors take it at different times, but what this course feeds into is the next course we have in the ther thermal fluid systems track, and that's fluid mechanics. So there you'll bring in Newton's laws as well as, so, we, so in this course we talked about conservation of mass, first law and the second law. When you get into fluid mechanics, you'll also deal with conservation of mass, the first law to some degree, but then you really focus a lot on Newton's laws. So 
the momentum equation is really what it comes down to, as well as many other topics, but that's where Newton's laws come into play. And then the course after that, and oh, there's a lab associated with that as well, so I'll, I've highlighted that too. So this is the lecture, here's the lab, and then that feeds into heat and mass transfer. So we talk about thermodynamics, that's really a foundational course, leads into fluid mechanics, that's you know analyzing the movement of fluid. And then heat mass transfer looks at the heat transfer part. Now in thermodynamics, we just said heat transfer, there was some number associated with it. You know, some heat transfer occurs. But in heat mass transfer, we focus on the different, different types of heat transfer. Uh, conduction, convection, radiation, and then calculating how much heat transfer occurs when you have a certain temperature difference and maybe there's fluid flowing past and things like that. So that's where those details are. And then let me skip to this one here, this box. We have some ME electives. So currently in our program, we have three ME electives. And you can choose from a variety of courses there. One of the courses you can choose from is ME 300. That's thermodynamics two. So what that course does is it extends what you've learned in the current course. So you cover some of the same topics, but then you extend it to look at things like mixtures, combustion, what happens when you have humidity involved, things like that. So it extends the ideas of what we've been talking about. And then lastly, we have this box. I put it in a dash line. This is our capstone senior design course, ME 463. Takes into account, hopefully, all the various things you've learned throughout your entire curriculum in some sort of design project. So I put it as a dashed box because it's not specifically focused on thermofluids, but it takes a lot of different things into account, including thermofluids concepts, depending on the kind of project you're involved in. So what you've learned in ME 200 in this course is gonna get used quite a bit in other courses as well. Specifically, you know, one, two, and call it two and a half courses you're gonna be required to take if you're an ME major here at Purdue and then possibly in one of your ME electives in engineering design. And then there are a whole series of graduate level courses that you could take that also involve thermofluid systems. So intermediate fluid mechanics, heat transfer at the graduate level, gas dynamics, which is really kind of compressible flow. You know, just a whole variety of things I won't get into. So that's how this course fits into the entire curriculum. And I think that's it. That's really all I wanted to show you I'm not going to go through a recap of all the various topics. You can take a look at the course policies document. There's too much to go through there. But hopefully I, you feel like you've learned a lot in the course. I know that my experience teaching the course, I do see a tremendous amount of development in students when they first come in and when they leave. You know, students first come in, they see the first law for the first time, and it doesn't make any sense, and it seems very hard and very confusing. But by the end of the course, they look back on those initial problems and think, wow, those were actually pretty easy. That's a good sign. That means you've learned something. That's, that's the whole goal of taking a, a, a course is to learn something. You don't, if you come into the course knowing all the stuff already, there's no point in taking the course, right? You come in to learn something. So hopefully you feel like you've learned a lot in the course and uh, hopefully you're set up well for future courses. So with that, we'll go ahead and end the video and end the course. Thank you.